Good morning. Welcome to the Longstore Legislative Summit Breakfast. We are so happy to see all of you this morning. First of all, I would want to thank Texas Healthcare Association for being our presenting sponsor for the event today. If you are with them, would you please stand up so we can recognize you, please? Texas Healthcare Association people. Thank you very much. It takes many sponsors to make a event of this magnitude happen, and uh, we are so happy to have our panel sponsors, which are Chevron, Associated General Contractors of Texas, Chenier, and Raise Your Hand, Texas. Our dominant sponsors are the Alabama Kashani Tribe of Texas, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas, Holland and Knight, Suddenly, Sabine River Authority of Texas, Nacogdoches Independent School District, Texans for Lawsuit Reform, and Texas Electric Cooperatives. Thank you very much, too. We have many more sponsors besides them, but we have this wonderful program, and if you have not picked up one, please pick one up, and you can read all about all of our panelists, and the rest of our sponsors are listed, so you can give them recognition throughout the day and thank them for their sponsorship and having this event. We also want to thank our Government Affairs Committee. Uh, if you're on that committee, please stand up so we can recognize you because it's taken a lot of people to make this event happen. Thank you very much. We want to thank Representative Flaherty and Senator Nichols. They have been instrumental in their help in forming this event. And they have been here for many years helping make this event happen. So thank you all very much. We want to thank Stephen F. Austin State University for these wonderful facilities. We'd like to thank Dr. Gordon. I don't know that he is here this morning. I think uh, uh, he has a problem uh, with some illness. So anyway, but thanks to everybody associated with SFA. We also want to thank the staff for all of our wonderful meals in our lunch today. We. Uh, really enjoy having events and having a location like this to have these events. Uh, if you parked in the parking garage, SFA has been very generous and you will not need to pay a fee. So I talked with someone earlier who actually got on the app and paid this morning before she got here. And I'm just want to tell you, the rest of you do not get on your apps and do not pay that parking fee. You don't have to. If you are a sponsor, Remember to go see Barbara at the registration desk because y'all have some nice little gift bags that you want to take home with you. We didn't want you to carry them around last night, so we have them at the registration desk and so you can go see her and get those. At this time, I would like to introduce my co-chair, Ted Smith. Good morning. Thank you, Donna. You know, I think everybody here knows all the the ongoings that go on to put on an event. So if you would help me give Donna Finley a big round of applause. She does so much for this event and makes it work. I'm, I'm just the guy that tags along and uh, does the heavy lifting when she needs it. But seriously, as far as the parking, I, you know, no fees, but if you do get a boot on there, I, hey, no promises there. You're on your own if they boot your, boot your wheel. But thank you all for being here. Uh, I hope you got a little taste of our town last night. We enjoyed having you. I hope you can stay through the weekend. The weather you see today, this is every day, 365 <laughs> days a year. That freeze when it came down just went right around Nacogdoches. We, we were sunny in 70, right, Clardy? Thank you for that weather report. You did a great job. So, With that, I'm going to introduce Todd Brown. He's the um, assistant dean at, at Stephen F. Hall, or chair, chair of the College of Business for Stephen F. Austin and our Chairman of the Board for the Chamber of Commerce and he's going to help get our event going. So Dr. Todd Brown. Well, uh, uh, I also want to give uh, Donna and Ted a uh, round of applause. Uh, they did a great job uh, organizing this event. So. But uh, my name is Todd Brown and I'm the uh, Chair of the Board of the Chamber of Commerce this year for Nacogdoches. And I want to welcome y'all to uh, Nacogdoches. And uh, it's a beautiful time of the year to be here in Nacogdoches. And uh, welcome you all to the Lone Star Legislative Summit. 
We, uh, we appreciate all that the legislators do uh, for us on a daily basis. You know, it was just about a, a year ago that uh, a group of us went to Austin and uh, we went to visit a few legislators and uh, we went to the Capitol and uh, the front door was locked. We went around to the back and they had this big tent set up and uh, we had to go through the tent, get screened, and then we went inside the rotunda and there wasn't anybody in there. We went down in the extension. We went down the extension. We found that uh, it was business as usual. The legislators were doing the work of the people. And uh, I just, I really do appreciate what all the legislators do on a daily basis without us knowing a lot. But they do the work of, uh, of the, the people at, uh, of Texas. And uh, we appreciate you very much. Uh, now I want to uh, have our invocation, and uh, I'd like to introduce John Ruckel. He's a graduate of SFA, and uh, after that he uh, spent a life in insurance business. Uh, but he was president of the state and national uh, board of insurance, and uh, he's a former chair of the board of Nacogdoche Chamber of Commerce. But most importantly, he's the architect of the Lone Star Legislative Summit, and the reason y'all are probably here today. So with that, uh, Mr. Ruckel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and naturally I have to respond to that introduction. In 2006, when I went to the chamber board and said, have I got a great idea? We're going to get the people in Austin and Washington, D.C. to come to Nacogdoches instead of us going to see them. And they said, Ruckel, we know you don't do drugs, so you must have been drinking this morning. <laughs> so thank you, members of the legislature, for being here. And a quick civic lessons. Most of you know this, but I'm going to give you a reminder. Mr. Speaker, I know you've seen the most recent census, and Texas is about to hit about 30 million residents. Out of that 30 million residents every couple of years, we elect... 31 individuals to serve in our state senate and we elect 150 to serve in our state house of representatives that's a big job for 181 people and i just want to compliment you i want to thank you for your service to all of us and especially want to thank you members that are here today let's pray father i thank you for the, this country and i pray that you would give wisdom and thought to the people that lead this country, our elected officials. Father, I want to thank you for allowing us to live in this great state of Texas that we love so much and that you have blessed so much. I pray a special blessing for our members of the legislature that are here with us today for their service. I thank you for the people, their staffs who support them. Father, we would ask that you would bless this event and the things we do and say here today will be pleasing to you Thank you for this wonderful meal and the, 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 what it provides to our health, but also thank you for the people who prepared it and served it. Um, see that everyone makes it home safe. In your son's name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, John, I appreciate that. Uh, Good prayer. Next, uh, we have a welcome from the university, and uh, Dr. Gordon, you know, is uh, sick this morning, so uh, we have the next best thing. We have uh, Karen Gantz. She's the chair of our Board of Regents at SFA, and she's also a uh, SFA graduate. So, uh, welcome, Karen. I look forward to speaking to Dr. Gordon soon and describing myself as the next best thing to him. <laughs> That's going to be fun. Um, you have been welcomed thoroughly already, but I want to continue that. Um, as chair of the Board of Regents of Stephen F. Austin State University, we are so glad that you are here. We are grateful to Senator Nichols and Representative Clardy and all of the sponsors who have made this event happen so we have the opportunity to showcase SFA and our beautiful campus. A few years ago, Governor Abbott was at this event, and he described SFA as the most beautiful college campus in Texas. And we agree. 
So we hope that you have the opportunity to, between sessions today, take a peek around campus, see our facilities, uh, take a look at what we have to offer in Nacogdoches if you're not from here. I met several folks yesterday who said this is their first time in Nacogdoches, this is their first time at Stephen F. Austin State University, and this is our chance to show you how special our little corner of uh, Texas is. So look around, enjoy yourselves, enjoy this day. Next year is our centennial anniversary as a university in 2023. We will have many centennial events associated with that. We want you to come back to those before you return the following year to the next Lone Star Legislative Summit. <laughs> Until then, enjoy your day today, enjoy campus, and uh, Axum Jacks. <laughs>Thank you, Karen. Uh, just like Dr. Gordon, we appreciate that. Uh, now it's uh, my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce our co-hosts for the event. Uh, Senator Robert Nichols was first elected in uh, 2006, represent the third uh, district of uh, Texas. He's known as a leader in transportation. He chairs the Senate's Transportation Committee. Uh, he's also on the Finance, Business and Commerce and uh, Criminal Justice Committees. More locally, he secured funding for the uh, DeWitt School of Nursing Building, Ed and Gwen Cole STEM Building. And uh, he carried a bill in, uh, at the university that states their name as Stephen F. Austin forever and eternity. <laughs> Most recently, uh, this last year, he uh, secured $45 million for an interdisciplinary and applied sciences building. He's a huge friend of SFA and this Nacogdoches and East Texas region. Please help me welcome Senator Robert Nichols. If you haven't been welcomed enough already, you're going to get one more. They said that's what I was supposed to do. I did it last night. I'll do it again this morning. I uh, thank the very much Stephen F. Olson for letting us use your facility. As far as getting that money, uh, I think Travis will tell you he got the other half of it on the House side. Nothing happens without the House and the Senate working together. Um, but I do want to welcome everyone here. I will tell you, I, I get, we all, I'm talking about the members of the House, and I said, we get a lot of invitations in different places around the state. And my staff knows what my usual answer is. Is it in the district? And if the answer is no, it's not in the district, I usually say no. I don't have, I'm not going to go because I don't have enough time to go everywhere I need to go in my own district. And so when you ask a member to leave their district to come to your district, that's a big ask. And so uh, we recognize the efforts of the members of the House and the members of the Senate who are here today who left their district to come to Travis and I's district. And it means a lot to me, and it means a lot to the people, uh, not just Nacogdoches, but here in East Texas. They came. We had people I saw from Jasper, from many counties around, who came here just to see and listen to y'all today. And so uh, we greatly appreciate your efforts to be here, and I hope that you feel totally welcome, because you really are. Thank you. All right, now we get to introduce our other co-hosts. Uh, Travis uh, Clardy. Uh, he was elected in 2013 to serve uh, House District 11. He serves on the Elections uh, Committee and Cultural, Recreation, and Tourism Committees. He's just appointed to a four-year term to the Sunset Commission. And in 2013, uh, he got our town, our city, designated as the Garden Capital of Texas. And how appropriate it is uh, today, if, uh, if you haven't had a chance to drive around the city, I highly suggest uh, you uh, check out all these azaleas that are blooming in town. I think Travis is responsible for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he fiercely uh, defends SFA's independence, and along with those buildings that uh, we announced, uh, Ed and Gwen Cole STEM building, and uh, he also got this uh, $45 million inter interdisciplinary and applied sciences building and two million dollars for our Center for Advanced Research and Rural Innovation. We appreciate all those things. Please help me welcome Representative Travis Clardy.
Well, good morning. And uh, Senator Nichols, let me show you a real welcome. <laughs> now listen, you think you've been welcome, but I want to really, really welcome you to Nacogdoches, the oldest town in Texas, uh, and yes, in fact, uh, the, the garden capital of Texas. I'm reminded of my, my colleague Drew Darby's down there, and I thought for a second I was going to go down in flames on that one, because in his district near San Angelo, it's a community called Gar 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 Garden City, yes, and so Garden City is in West Texas. And we're going to be the garden capital of Texas. And he was taking some umbrage of that. But he took pity on a poor freshman legislator trying to pass his first bill and let it slide. So for Drew, for that, I'm eternally grateful. Um, but uh, it is great to be here this morning. I have a lot of people I want to thank and recognize uh, that are part of this program. But just look around you. Look at this crowd that we have this morning. Uh, you know, a lot of the folks in this room I've seen, they, they like getting up around the crack of noon. Uh, so it's kind of unusual to have them here at this time of the morning, but you know they wanted to be here to be part of this. And this has turned into a very special event. I, I really do want to start by thanking Senator Nichols. Uh, he and I have worked together since uh, I was first elected in 2013. He's really been a mentor and a leader. Uh, folks in this community know how important he is to East Texas and for all of Texas. Uh, and you know he is the go-to guy on so many issues, uh, one of which we'll talk about today with infrastructure and transportation. Uh, a lot of times I don't have to go get the research or do all the work. I say what do I need to do, Robert? And he tells me, and off we go. Uh, and that's worked very well through the years. Uh, but but he is he is uh, he lives in Jacksonville. Uh, that's his hometown, but you know neighboring county. But he takes very seriously representing all of his district, as you mentioned, not just the, the town that he lives in, but really all of us. So uh, he's to be commended. We're very fortunate to have what I think is is really truly one of the best senators in the in the state. Now there's a couple of others. I'm gonna, if you don't mind, Senator, we have some of your colleagues with us this morning. I know I saw Senator Buckingham is with us. Thank you, Don, for being here. Our next uh, land commissioner. And let me remind everybody, we do have elections coming up, and there's a runoff election. And remember, Don Buckingham, land commissioner. Uh, let me see, is Nathan Johnson here this morning? I didn't see Nathan a little bit. Yep. Oh, I saw fingers. I saw his hand. I keep seeing hands go up. I don't see Nathan. All right, uh, and then also uh, Larry Taylor, we saw him last night. Uh, but let me, I'd like to introduce some of our friends that came, came in for this event because it is, some have traveled a long way. I do think one of your Senate colleagues, uh, Cesar Blanco, is going to win the award for distance travel from El Paso. Uh, that's not exactly an easy commute. Uh, so, but with us this morning, I think I've, I've noted who's here, uh, Doc Anderson is with us today from Waco. Thank you, Doc, for being here. Uh, I didn't see Ernest this morning. I think Courtney's coming in, so that may have detained, detained him. Uh, Keith Bell is with us from Forney. Thank you, Keith. Uh, John Busey made it in. I want to thank John. He called me yesterday. Now, I'm going to pick on my Democratic colleagues a little bit. They've been known at the last minute to kind of fall out without much warning. And John was trying, I could feel that hook. I had him on the line, I was bringing him in, I could feel that hook starting to slip. And uh, I gave him a pretty good tug. He called me about four o'clock, said, well, do you really need me there? I wasn't gonna let him go. I said, yes, I, we really need you here, John. So he loaded up, he showed up last night, got in time for dinner, and then had a great time, I might add, uh, going to see Aaron Watson last night. So uh, that was a, a good good event. Uh, Drew Darby, I mentioned from San Angelo, thank you, Drew. Uh, Jay Dean is here just up the road from us, from Longview. Uh, thank you, Jay. Harold Dutton, I saw you wander in here some. There you are, Harold, in the back from Houston, and he's going to be on our Public Education Committee. Uh, let me see. Uh, Dan Uberty down in the front. Thank you, Dan, for being here. Uh, and then I've also got, I didn't see uh, Jaton or Kemple this morning. John needs his beauty sleep, so I think he's probably still checking in. Uh, Dennis Paul is here from Houston. There you are, Dennis. Uh, I think, is, am I correct, Dennis, our only uh, uh, professional engineer uh, in the... The only PE in, in the legislature, not just the House. And, uh, well, Nichols is, uh, there <laughs> I, I haven't seen his PE stamp, Dennis, I got to tell you. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's funny you mention that, Dennis, because uh, Senator Nichols is always prone to remind me when we do this event that um, uh, we, we, rec we, we are the ones responsible to call our colleagues to have them attend. And we, we've had such a great response through the years to do this, and I want to thank all of y'all for coming in. But Robert's always very quick to he knows he's only got 31 to hunt from and he only needs four or five. See, so he has to make a few calls. Well, I've got 150 and I've got to, you know, winnow out the crowd and who's gone before and who needs to come this time and do all this stuff. So it takes a little time. We went up with around 25. But he's always very quick to remind me, Dennis, that, you know, one senator is worth five representatives. <laughs> and uh, so. Uh, 
It was, uh, you know, I'm not sure about that math, but you know, I'll tell you what, Speaker Phelan put me over the top because he was claiming victory. And I said, we can't count each other in the totals to do the, do the math. I said, now hold on. I got Speaker Phelan coming. He counts for bonus points. So I think I won this year on the invitations. Um, so there's some other folks here I want to recognize. Matt Schaefer is in the room. Uh, Representative Schaefer, there you are, Matt. Just from down the road in Tyler. It's great to have Matt with us. He drove in this morning. Uh, he thinks he's going home this afternoon, but I'm not so sure about that. We're going to try to get Jason to come join us as well. Uh, is James White here? Does he see James? Okay. All right. So, uh, but, but it's a great, great lineup. Uh, I will say this about these panels that you'll get to see today. Uh, I remember the first time we did this and the uh, impression I had, you know, I, I knew these people well. We'd served together. Uh, and you build those relationships. But you don't get to work with all of them because you're on your own committees, you're not in some of the other rooms. So you, you get a, a, an acquaintance, but really not the knowledge of the, the members you serve with. And I remember being struck then, and I think you'll be struck today, uh, by the quality of people that represent you in Austin. Uh, and I would sit there and really my jaw would just drop listening to my colleagues in these different issues, whether it be education or transportation or, or uh, you know, whatever the, the, the subject du jour is, uh, how well-spoken, how thoughtful, uh, how uh, well researched, uh, how dedicated, and what you could really tell was the passion and the love that we all share for the state of Texas. And these people are truly public servants, and I'm proud, proud, proud to serve with each and every one of you. And you will see that today, and I think you'll come away. You know, sometimes we watch the news uh, and government gets a, a black eye, sometimes deservedly so. Uh, but I want to tell you that in Austin, uh, your government works for you and works well. Uh, these are people that are dedicated uh, public servants uh, and that are on the job. You know, I've had people show up, Senator, that they come see us. We have a, a hearing going on in the Senate and the House. And, you know, we don't take lunch breaks or timeouts. It, it, we just roll. And so uh, we'll be there two or three in the morning. And people don't realize that we do that and that we're, we keep going. Several times this session, we had 24 hour plus days. Uh, serving on the elections committee, some of the special committees. I'm not saying I'll say that we're the you know, hardest working people on the planet. There's a lot of people in this, in this community and around the world that work very, very hard. But I do think it's important uh, for you to realize that uh, when they're there, they are there and, and doing what they believe is best for the state of Texas. And they work hard and diligently. Uh, and I hope you have the same takeaway that I had that first time uh, when I look at these people and, and you, that you should be proud of the quality and the integrity of the people uh, that serve in legislature. Uh, you know, that even includes Gary Van Dever, Drew, it does, uh, from Texarkana, my, my colleague, and David Spiller. I'm, now I'm starting to look around the room, David Spiller here, uh, and, and uh, I'm not, okay, Lynn Stuckey. Uh, Lynn Stuckey's here from Denton, and then John Rainey's here. Uh, y'all, some of y'all, you Shine is here. You guys are breeding out there, what happened? Uh, so, uh, thank you, man. Well, y'all always make me look good by showing up here. Uh, anybody else that I missed on the rep side? Cody Harris, Cody Harris snuck in here. And I tell you what, I'm proud to see Cody here. Uh, he, he inherited, and I'm, I'm still upset about this, Cody, but I lost through the redistricting process, Cherokee County. I got that county in great shape. Yeah, I mean, perfect. And then Cody swoops in and takes it from me. But, uh, no, he, he, they're great folks. I'm really proud. He's going to do a great job. He's in Anderson County, Palestine. Uh, and he will do a fantastic job. He's been in D.C. Y'all just flew, got back in, uh, I guess, late last night. So thank you for being here, Cody. I didn't see you slip in. So we're going to put you to work. You're going on a panel. You just didn't know that. Um, but, okay, anybody else? All right. Well, there's one fellow over here. We're going to talk about him in a little bit. So uh, <laughs> let me see who else we got here. Um, we've got oh, one fellow I do want to recognize down the front. There's a several... After this event, the First Lady of, of uh, House District 11 is not here this morning. Judy's getting ready for some other events because she's the president of the Legislative Ladies Club, and we're doing the spring fling, which she did back to back. We thought that'd be a good idea. Now that I'm running off a few hours sleep, I'm not so sure that was a good idea. But uh, she is doing that. Well, back in the day, uh, I looked down here in front of me. There, there, we'll have a lot of former members uh, of the legislature that will be here, and, and many of whom uh, work in the lobby and the associations. Uh, that continue to stay active in the government, uh, and, and they are sponsors and support this. I do want to thank all of those sponsors for being here. Uh, but one fellow in particular, Chuck Hobson, is down here in front, uh, and y'all may not remember this. It's been a long, long time ago, Chuck, but 2013, I lost my mind, decided, or 2011, 12, whatever, ran to, to run for the legislature. And Chuck was the member over in uh, Jacksonville's a new district, uh, and Chuck and I ran against each other. And I will tell you, uh, I'm, I'm still proud to this day, 
we had a campaign the way I think campaigns ought to be. Uh, we, no, it was no, we, we, you know, he's a pharmacist and he'd call me an old dirty trial lawyer and I'd call him a drug dealer. And, uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, really, but it was always in good fun. And we spent a lot of time together on the campaign trail. Uh, and just, it was a, a great experience. Never had an unkind word with one another. Really just had a, a, a outstanding experience. It, it, me, my introduction to that. But the most important thing I, I remember is the night of the election, we had a runoff. So this thing went on forever. I thought I was on a sprint, it wound up being a marathon. And we, uh, we went from, instead of ending in March, they moved the primary, if you remember, back to May. Then we had a runoff until, I didn't know I won until August 1st of that summer. And that's a lot of campaigning. And so, but as soon as that final result came in, my phone rang and picked it up, and it was Chuck Hobson. And Chuck said, Trav, he said, I'm proud of you. You ran a great race. He said, you know, anything that you need, anything I can do to help you to represent our people, I'm here for you. And I don't know about you, I think that's what we want in our government. You know, and, two, and lately we talked uh, yesterday at the Media Madness, we've seen this devolution and deterioration of relationships uh, in government. And I hope that we will all live up to the example that Chuck set for me in trying to be better and trying to remember this isn't our, this isn't my job. I'm the representative. I hold the office but it's not my office. We represent the people, and we should be respectful of one another in that, in that capacity. I think you'll see that today in the panels. Uh, you will see some heated debates. I really cannot wait to get into the immigration border uh, issue right off the bat. Uh, Schaefer came in, he's, he's wired for sound. He's, he is ready to go, and uh, Cesar Blanco, one of our El Paso senator, uh, will take the issue, and it will be hotly contested. It will be, uh, it won't be contentious, but it will be uh, very sharp, and it will be a, a, a sharp contrast. And you will see, that's one thing we try to do here. This is not a Republican or a Democratic event. This is a chamber event. It is nonpartisan, bipartisan, and we really make an effort, Senator, to, to go get our colleagues from around the state to come in and present those views. And again, you see that, that crucible, that exchange, that, that thing, that how policy is built. Uh, and But these events are important because they would allow us to have these conversations offline, uh, not with the procedural uh, issues and the things that happen in legislation, but it helps us uh, really flesh out the issues that are important to Texas and Texans. So uh, watch all that today, but it's going to be a, a great event. Uh, I'm going to finish up with this. I've got a few other folks to recognize. Um, but anyway, Chuck, thank you. Um, and, and, and Billy, too. I, tell you, I got to tell one quick story. I, I, it's a quick one. It's a quick one. Come on, you'll like this one, John. So, so uh, Chuck's, Chuck's wife, Billy, has a, a sister named Flossie. Has anybody ever known a Flossie? Flossie. And she's a piece of work. So we're over at Jacksonville with this one, this one uh, event, and she's in the back. And Chuck and, and Billy and his entourage are down in the front of the Jacksonville st uh, co a little uh, auditorium at the college. And I see Flossie, and Flossie's wondering, she's lost as a goose, and she's looking around, and, and, uh, and she's trying to find him. And I said, Flossie? I said, are you lost? And she said, no, I am not. I am saved by my personal Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I, and I'm thankful for that, Flossie, but if you're looking for Billy and Chuck, they're down the front. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that one always tickled me. Let me see, with uh, George Lane, uh, Lumberjack is here with the Attorney General Ken Paxton. George, you make it in this morning? All right, we have uh, Betty Russo, Officer of Governor is here okay and then also linda parker and also linda this morning uh here on behalf of my good friend deskmate classmate uh trent ashby of lufkin and thank you for being here linda and uh, trent had other business he thought he needs to make money for some unknown reason he's off on, he's doing banking business today uh out of state so uh also we have uh some uh, justice melissa goodwin i don't think mark and bliss have made it in this morning uh kathy comer kathy you with us there she is all right I'll have more to say about you at lunch. Uh, Melinda Carty is here with uh, Congressman Gomert's office. Uh, Tucker Anderson and Jeff Mursky with uh, uh, Congressman Pete Sessions. There we go. Thank you all for being here. Our new congressman, and always, he's always welcome in this town, and we're going to get him next time for the uh, Lone Star Summit. Uh, and then finally, our mayor, my good friend, banker, and campaign treasurer, uh, Jimmy Mize. There you are, Jimmy. And uh, Judge Sal, uh, Greg, there you are, Greg, good to see you. Judge Sal's in the house with us. So, uh, and then finally, I'm going to introduce people that are very, very important to me. Uh, my chief of staff, there he is. See, he's the last one to eat. He's been working. Sloan Byerly. Uh, no, that's, that's Kyle coming in. Where's, where's Sloaney? There you are, Sloan. All right. 
Sloan is my chief of staff. I hired Sloan. He was a great hire. He, you know, my dad's from Brownwood, Texas, and he came in. I saw on the uh, his resume, and uh, that he said, "Well, I'm you know Brownwood." And I said, "Well, my dad was Brownwood, class of '42." He said, "Well, actually, I'm from Early, Texas, the the Highland Park of Brownwood." <laughs> and, uh, so uh, I, that that made up my mind right there. That's why I hired him. I stole him away from Stucky. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Jerry Jones, y'all know Jerry, where are you, Jerry? Uh, Linda, don't get mad, but in my humble opinion, best district director in the state of Texas right there. Uh, she does a fantastic job in constituent services and all those things that make this thing work. She's constantly giving me my list and things to do and pointing me in the right direction. And I try to go there, Jerry, I really do. And, uh, but she does a fantastic job and, and uh, really I could not do this thing without her. So thank you to my staff for, for, for this event. So uh, with that, I think um, the next thing up is for me to bring our speaker to speak and bring him forward. Uh, you know, I first met uh, uh, Dave Phelan as a young freshman, and I knew he was wet behind the ears because he sat immediately in front of Ashby and me on the floor of the house. And so uh, the, the speaker was had come in from Beaumont, fellow East Texan. Uh, you know, he's committed this area, long family history uh, in this part of the world. Uh, and, and he's just, you know, I've gotten to know uh, Speaker Phelan over the years. Uh, we got a lot in common. He's got four sons. I've got four sons. In fact, he came in last night. I appreciate you coming in. I'm really glad you didn't fly in because I'm hearing horror stories from Brother Shine and, and from Senator Buckingham and these others about some of the flight uh, situations. So I'm glad you, you uh, drove Chrysler in from uh, Beaumont. So he... Uh, but he came in at a ball game. It's one of his boys' baseball game. They won 14 to three. We learned last night at dinner. Uh, you know, but he's he's a dedicated father and husband. His wife Kim is a lovely, lovely lady. I was hoping she could be here for spring fling, but they've got the duties and family down in, in Beaumont. Uh, but he has come into the position of speaker. Uh, we'd had a rather contentious session. Uh, end of session, I should say, the time before, and we needed some normalcy. We needed leadership in that position and a, somebody that we all trusted. Uh, he was chosen, yes, by the Republican caucus within our procedures and our rules to pick a, a, a member out of our caucus as the majority party, but I will tell you, Dade also enjoys the support of the Democratic caucus. Now, uh, some of them may have strained that relationship a bit when they took a little vacation to Washington, D.C., but I'll let him talk about that. Uh, but, you know, he, he's a person you can talk to. He appreciates what we are trying to do. He understands uh, that we are there to serve the people of Texas. He provides that leadership, but in a way that allows the members to represent their districts uh, and also to work on those things. We're a very diverse state, a lot of things, different things to do, uh, and Dave knows that. And he, he helps us uh, a fashion, a game plan. He defends the institution of the House, uh, and, and he really does work tirelessly and diligently for all of us and, and the members, uh, and which uh, I think really is one of the pr uh, principal jobs is, is to protect the membership and, and help us work together. Because, you know, after about 130 days or so, going on a 140-day session, not to mention three specials after, uh, the room, we get, you know, we get a little weary of each other. We've seen each other's ties and, you know, and heard each other's jokes and we're getting a little, you know, that's why we, we like to see each other right now, but after 140 days, we're ready for everybody to go home. And, uh, and, and, and he provides us a good civil workplace uh, and, and constant steady leadership. Uh, it, it is an honor to have him here with us today, Speaker. I thank you for taking the time to join us in Nacogdoches. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce us, Texas, the Speaker of the Texas House, the Honorable Dade Phelan. Of course, he doesn't pull the microphone down. Thank you, Travis. <laughs> and I would say good morning, but after that, good evening. <laughs> oh, I forgot something. Oh, yeah, he's a, one more story. Hold on a second. Uh, told my wife I'd pick up carpool today. Uh, made to pick it up Monday. No, uh, thank you, Travis, uh, for having us here. Thank you for the invitation. This is my first Lone Star Summit. Uh, I haven't been able to make it. Like uh, Senator Nichols said, you know, we all have so many commitments back home, and uh, it's difficult to leave the district. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed I didn't come earlier because this is a, a wonderful event. The, the attendance is phenomenal. Uh, Nacogdoches is a beautiful town. Um, thank you for the Chamber of Commerce. 
for uh, your work here. Senator Nichols, thank you for co-hosting the well. Senator Nichols is now my, I, I voted for him uh, this past cycle. He's now my uh, new senator in Beaumont, Texas, um, taking over half of Jefferson County, but I, we worked well in the past. Um, he's, uh, he's been senator for Orange County, which I represent. Um, and uh, my niece, uh, Molly, just graduated uh, from uh, SFA. She's, um, She's now working for uh, Disney World, which we can talk about later, by the way. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, all my house colleagues, thank y'all for being here. Um, wonderful to see your faces again, kind of. Um, and uh, senators as well, uh, thank y'all for being here. Uh, I am now officially a, an East Texas state rep because I picked up Jasper County in redistricting. So. Yes, so in the, the past eight years or so, I've represented Jefferson County and Orange County, which is the Gulf Coast. It is not technically East Texas, so now I'm behind the pine curtain. I'm, I'm, I speak your language. She can decipher me. Uh, this Southeast Texas mushmouth uh, hybrid Cajun is now East Texan, so wonderful to be here. I, I told a story last week in Austin at the uh, TCCRI event. Uh, I've been doing this speaker thing since November 2019. As soon as the election results were kind of in, the speaker's race was off and running, and it's really been nonstop trying to ramp up for session with a very short window there, dealing with COVID and everything. And then, of course, the session went on, and then it didn't stop going on. We had special after special. So uh, I really, and then I went straight into fundraising for my colleagues raising like $9 million for my house colleagues to make certain that they were reelected and they came back here um, as they should because they did an excellent job. Thank you. <laughs> no, you'll get an invoice. You will get an invoice, trust me. You'll get an IOU. But um, so I finally, uh, I finally was able to take care of some things I need to take care of uh, and had that surgery on my, on my face, on my nose, and the, and, and the, the dermatologist was like, you, you know, you probably need to relax for about 10 days, not do anything. Uh, you're probably going to get some black eyes, which I did. I had two black eyes, and I looked awful. And back home, you know, they don't care if you're a speaker. I mean, you go to Austin, you're beautiful no matter what, right? Especially if you're a speaker. All your jokes are great. You're a good-looking man no matter what. Back home, they'll tell you exactly what's going on. And uh, they mean, you look, you look terrible. What happened to you? You get in a car accident? You get in a fight, and, I say, and, I, and so I would just tell them, this is what happens when you tell your wife you'll be home on May 31st, and you come home on October 19th, <laughs> especially with four boys under 13. So it was good to catch up on things. Uh, session was a, a unique session. Uh, I, I couldn't have predicted what, what occurred. We were walking into the first uh, session under a global pandemic in 102 years. There was no manual in how to operate. Trust me, we looked. It wasn't around, so we had to figure that out on the fly. We, we were one of the last state houses in the country to actually meet uh, during COVID, which was good because we kind of were able to see best practices in other states, but, uh, but on the flip side, we were one of the last legislatures to address COVID. And so we had our work cut out for us. I can tell you from the House perspective, we didn't want to meet and debate 10,000 bills that are filed that impact 30 million Texans without hearing from those Texans. So we try to be as open and transparent as possible. It had its issues. We had to change our rules. We had to go virtual in some respects. But at the end of the day, it was, uh, it worked out. And things, the, the trains ran on time and we got a lot, a, very, a lot accomplished. We were looking at, put this way, when we left 2019, we were supposed to have $8 billion surplus. At some point during the pandemic, the comptroller said, you have a $20 billion deficit. And that is phenomenal. But because of the work that you all did in small, medium, and large businesses, because of everyone getting back to work in the state of Texas, we were able to pass a balanced budget that, that uh, secured our commitment to public education, which we made in 2019, which was a big commitment. Uh, we basically fixed 60 years of, of work that, um, that every legislator tried to, 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 to accomplish under court orders. We didn't have a court order, we just did it. And I want to thank Dan Huberty for his work on that. Um, 
public education advocate and a chair of public ed who, who did a phenomenal job. And but what kept me up at night in, in December, going into January last session is hey, we're gonna walk back this promise on public education because we don't have the money. But we were able to do that. We were able to fully fund public education, higher education, border security, uh, our commitment to COVID response uh, in a very short period of time because we came together and had, I, I thought of an excellent budget night. And that's really, is, 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 other than redistricting, which we also ended up doing in October, that is truly our, our one constitutional requirement in the state of Texas. Uh, we had a, a little storm called Yuri. Uh, that wasn't on my bingo card for session, but it happened. And we made as many necessary reforms I thought we could in the short window we had. For those of you who are following, that storm hit, and with about 10 days, we had bill filing deadline. We had basically less than two weeks to come up with legislation to try to address a grid that serves 90% of the state of Texas, wholly independent of the rest of the country. It's been around, you know, ERCOT's been around 60 years. So you, you can almost, in my opinion, do more harm than good by overreacting. So we did, we did some great work. We have a lot of great work to do. Where we reformed ERCOT, we reformed the PUC, we have new talent in there, new ideas, new perspectives. And so we're not done with it. It is a very complex situation. I, I chair state affairs for one session, which oversees the PUC and ERCOT, those issues. It is, it is so complex and it is uh, so important that you, it's going to take more than one session to address our grid. Uh, the Capitol flooded the next month. That went on my bingo card. I was waiting for the frogs to start raining down and the locusts to, well, we do have the uh, grasshoppers. Or, no, we have the crickets. We have the crickets. But truthfully, uh, it, it, was, it was a session like none other. And I know everyone says that post-session, but you couldn't have, you couldn't have really, um, you couldn't have told me back in January what we would be uh, facing, and I would, I would not have believed you, and I probably would have quit the job and, and gone back home. But, um, you know, enough about last session. Let's talk about what we're about to do. Um, interim charges are out in both the House and the Senate. Committees were meeting as of yesterday. We have a lot of work to do. And this is our first interim since, you know, basically four years. So we've not met and discussed these items in the interim since pre-COVID. And so for some members, they've never even had an interim. And it's amazing how many new members we have, but some even have experienced interim hearings. So that's up and running the, the House. We, we released our interim charges about three, four weeks ago. Roughly the Senate did it last week. A lot of our priorities overlap, a lot of them do not. I can tell you, I personally, I care about very few items uh, because I let the House kind of run itself and let the members decide what they want to do and how they want to vote their districts. But criminal justice reform is an issue that I will continue to push. I think Texas has led on it in the past and we need to continue to lead on it. The, uh, it's economic development, in my opinion. We have so many individuals moving to Texas and so many that already live here and we have done falling in love with the penal code. We love to prosecute people. We love to penalize people. Just being from Southeast Texas, I love statistics. There are 13 different felonies that you can be charged with on the illegal harvesting of an oyster. You can go to prison 13 different ways by taking a bivalve out of a bay or estuary in the state of Texas. We love the penal code. And the point is we need to get back to uh, prosecuting and punishing those that we are scared of, not mad at. And so I think the state of Texas can lead on that. We have in the past and we should lead on that going forward. And the, the House has passed, last session in, in particular, passed a, a bunch of legislation to, to address that second chances. We want to respect the victims. We want to make certain we have robust public safety here in the state of Texas, but we need to take a fresh perspective on how we administer our laws. Uh, no one has more individuals locked up in jail than the state of Texas in this entire world. We have 150,000 people on any given day incarcerated right now. And truthfully, I think that the future is juvenile justice reform, which we, we had a hearing yesterday on. And truthfully, when you start getting into that area, of law, it is, it's, in, it's insane what we do to children. You all know about CPS, you know about what's going on in our, in our child welfare state and our, in our, uh, in our uh, you know, whether it's foster homes, 
especially post-COVID, these children age out of that system, and where do we put them? TDCJ, because we have nowhere else to put them. Uh, healthcare reform. As a Republican, we typically ignore healthcare, and we just say no, no, no. And thing, you know, the Democratic Party sends ideas our way, and we just say no with no uh, alternative. And so, uh, there was another priority of mine last session was to let's get into healthcare reform. Let's look at it from a uh, you know free market system. Uh, let's, let's talk about transparency and uh, accountability. Because it's an item that when you sit down at, at the kitchen table and talk about your budget, it's probably number one. It's probably one the most thing people spend on is healthcare. The number one item is healthcare. And Texas can do better about that. And we passed, I'm not gonna get into all the legislation we passed last session, but it was phenomenal. Uh, Bobby Jindal, former governor of Louisiana, uh, my next door neighbor. Uh, I think I feel like I represent half, you know, half of Calcasieu Parish and Caraman Parish. I feel like they're in my district. But he wrote an, a, a, a really phenomenal op-ed in, in the Wall Street Journal praising not what Louisiana did on health care reform, but what Texas did on health care reform last session. And how we, we created the model, Texas created the model for health care reform. And other states should look at what we did on whether it's, whether it's uh, hospital pricing and transparency or prescription drug. We have a new prescription drug program that's not up and running yet. It's, it's still working its way through the rules process. But it truly was excellent reform. Uh, as a, as a pro-life Republican, I, I feel like we should protect life from the womb to the tomb. And so we did things on maternal mortality that Texas has never done. We expanded and, 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 um, and actually reformed healthcare and Medicaid for children and make certain they wouldn't fall off the rolls. 60,000 children every year in Texas will not fall off healthcare Medicaid because of reforms we did last uh, this last session. And so we're putting our money where our mouth is when it comes to children's health, and we're not done. We're gonna we're gonna keep moving forward. The um, workforce development, as this state is just unbelievably blown up right now, as you all know, workforce development is, is a huge. We need to obviously align industry needs with education. Make sure there's unbelievable synergy there. We've done great work. We have a lot more work to do. Infrastructure. You can ask any voter right now what they feel about infrastructure. It'd be the top of their list. It is a it is voters approve infrastructure just as past session of uh, constitutional amendment 2021. They they uh, overwhelmingly supported Prop Two to allow counties to pass bonds for infrastructure in underserved and blighted areas. Infrastructure improvement is something that the state is probably far far behind on, quite frankly, given the the, the size of the state and the growth of this state. So that is something I think you're going to see the House be very, very um, interested in, and, and uh, we're going to have a robust discussion on, on infrastructure because I'm going to get to some economic numbers that are truly amazing here in the state of Texas that could support this type of investment. And, uh, you know, last thing, affordable housing. This is something that's kind of come on my radar just in the last month or so. And I have affordable housing in Southeast Texas. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't have the kind of uh, crazy spike in growth that you see in the larger cities, but I had a meeting with these individuals who have just moved to Texas, mostly in the Austin area. And uh, I was meeting with them, and one guy who's an interesting guy, he's from Poland, and so I was like, what do you do? He's like, oh, I started this little company. Oh, which one is that, PayPal? Like, oh, okay, PayPal. <laughs> I've heard of PayPal, um, but they've all moved here, you know, to get away from California. I mean, we've heard that a million times, but they, they're literally in California for various reasons. But they're, one of their biggest concerns is affordable housing. How are these workers, if they're going to move these companies here and, re and, and relocate 5,000, 10,000 people, where are they going to live? And I think the solution as a Republican with a conservative mindset yeah, uh, as you look at so they now and it's, let's say the Travis County Austin area. One one individual was going to buy 600 acres and he was going to start his own housing development, and he was going to basically underwrite it, and for his employees, and then he started seeing the setbacks, and the and the, all the permitting he had to do, and all the environmentals and the different materials he was required to use, and the threat of not being able to have things like natural gas. And all the different requirements of that area of the state were gonna pile on top of them. He said, there's no way I, can, I can't afford this. I can't make it work. 
and I'm worth like $9 billion. So if he can't do it, who can do it? And so I think we have to look at the regulations, and I passed a bill in 2019, and I still get grief for it from some communities, but there are communities out there, cities that were requiring, like for instance, your home, your home had to be built com completely in brick. You couldn't use EFIS, you couldn't use stucco, you couldn't use wood, because we've only been building houses out of wood for 10,000 years. <laughs> and what they were doing is they, were, they, they want this homogenous society that everything looks the same and the property values are super high because that benefited them. But it wasn't right, it wasn't fair. And it drove up the, house of, the, the cost of housing. And then there were other cities that went there and said, oh, you have to, now you have to have a certain pipe inside your home. You have to have a certain shingle on your roof driving up the cost. So I think we need to look at that in the legislature and say, what is causing the spike in housing costs? What is, it co what is affordable housing and how do we do it? And, and maybe take a hard look at some of these ordinances where they're creating winners and losers, where you have to buy a certain product and all it does is drive up the cost. It doesn't make the home any safer. And so affordable housing, I think, especially in this, these times of um, inflation and supply chain issues is something that Texas really needs to look at because it is, it is, uh, if you're, if, if you're looking for a home right now, God bless you. Uh, I've seen the prices and I've seen the inventory and it's, it's not, it's not going to get any better. So maybe that's something the legislature can look at as well. But going back to infrastructure, what we did last session, talking about $30 billion of the Department of Transportation for their, their core uses. And again, these are the type of things that I was concerned about in January and December going back because we're going to have to raid our transportation fund to balance our budget. I mean, these were real concerns a year ago, but we were able to come through and, and uh, fully appropriate Prop 1, Prop 7, uh, cybersecurity, $100 million for cybersecurity. You, you see what's going on. Uh, I can tell you one thing, uh, going back to my state affairs days, is that uh, DIR, which is the technology, kind of the IT department for the state of Texas, they'll tell you about their cybersecurity threats. Um, going back to talking to ERCOT a couple years ago, they get about a each of them get well over a billion hits a month from overseas in cybersecurity threats, mostly from the, from China. And I represent China, Texas, not China, Texas, the China. Um, and they get about a billion dollar, they get about a billion hits every month of, 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 of you know these hackers trying to get into our system. I mean, can you imagine if they got a hold of ERCOT or if they got a hold of our DIR and our our Attorney General's office and child support? Or they, I mean, you can imagine the havoc they could read they could uh, uh, bring down on the state of Texas. So $100 million sounds like a lot, but it's probably something that it, it, it's gonna be a growing part of our budget. Uh, you know, we spent $40 million on the port. It's not enough. Our ports are our future, in my personal opinion. I have, I have ports in my district. The Port of Beaumont is the third busiest port in the United States of America. And it is where, um, it is the number one military export port in the country as well. So if there is a if there is a uh, a skirmish, let's say in the Middle East or in Europe, like what's happening right now, all that material, all the equipment will be going out of the Port of Bowman. And so we need to do more. It's, it's it's good for our roads to get them, get it off the roads and and, and onto the ports and uh, and onto the water and onto our um, intercoastal canal and uh, uh, parts beyond. But we we fully funded our entire infrastructure package, despite COVID and despite public education. Now we have $1.2 trillion coming from the federal government to the 50 states. And, and some of it um, is earmarked for very specific projects. But Texas is going to get approximately $35.6 billion in infrastructure support from the federal government over the next five years. And some of that will go through existing uh, measures, existing programs. And which is fine, but I can I can speak for every legislature in the uh, legislator in the room, especially Matt Schaefer in the back. The, the, the legislature needs to have input. We need to have oversight. We're not going to just give it to state agencies and say spend it how you how you spend it in the past or spend spend it how you want to spend it. And I hope I'm not stepping on any toes here. Let's say if but TechSot they have their own funding formulas, and I may not agree with those funding formulas because I come from Southeast Texas. I don't represent Houston or Dallas or San Antonio, so Austin, uh, 
you know, we all need our fair share of infrastructure spending. And so, whereas the, the federal government wants to send it straight to the agencies to have them, you know, to appropriate that, there has to be oversight from legislation to make certain that areas like Nacogdoches are represented with that $35 billion. And so, And so in, in that package as well uh, is, is an opportunity for uh, uh, high-speed internet and, and broadband across the state of Texas. So I think we're going to see somewhere in the a minimum of $100 million uh, through that infrastructure package to go to uh, high-speed internet and, and broadband uh, throughout the state of Texas. Um, so House Bill 5 was, was an excellent piece of legislation. I, I want to thank Senator Nichols and Representative Ashby for, for championing that legislation. And that was the, that was the core, the, the bones of how we're going to, you know, create a, a statewide broadband office and make certain that every corner of the state has this technology. It is the future. It is economic development. It is it's crucial to public education, higher education, telehealth, tele, telemedicine, which is now the future. Uh, my 12 year old has not seen his uh, his uh, allergies he's not seen his doctor in three years personally he just gets on a zoom and he gets his his allergy medicine you know uh, refilled and that's the way it should be and especially if you're in rural Texas as you see people more and more people wanting to work from home they can work anywhere in the world why not East Texas you know and, and then they don't have to go to the doctor they don't have to get in the car and drive to Houston they just get on a zoom and they knock it out. But without high-speed internet, none of that's attainable. And so we spent $500 million in that third special session when we finally got around to, to, to um, appropriating the ARPA funds, which was a totally different pocket of money from the federal government. So it, we, that's just the beginning. That $500 million is probably already spoken for, probably, Senator. I would think that it's already been allocated or at least uh, you know, RFPs out there. I mean, that's, a, that's just the first round. It's going to take billions of dollars to do this across the state of Texas, but the bill that was passed is 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 uh, treats everyone fairly. It's, it doesn't pick technologies one or the other. Whatever works in a community, whether it's fiber or, or satellite, whatever works, the, this new broadband bill is going to uh, allow that to happen, and it's a big deal. It's 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 truly, I think. Well, Areas like Nacogdoches and Beaumont will probably benefit more than anybody because folks will start looking at more rural areas. They, maybe they want to live on two or three acres. Uh, they don't want to commute. They don't want to be stuck in traffic on I-35 in Austin, Texas, or you know I-10 or the, the Beltway in Houston or San Antonio. So they'll, they'll start looking at more rural areas to um, to move and, and raise their, their families. Um, so the um, getting into infrastructure and the challenges we have. Um, I, when I first ran for office, I heard someone in the realtor's office say a thousand people move to Texas every day. And I've been saying it for seven years, whether or not that was true or not, it just sounded good. <laughs> and it was impressive, you know, that, and, but I went and checked, I went and checked the last uh, year of the census, 2020. This is during a pandemic. 1,039 people moved to Texas in 2020. That was during the pandemic when you probably couldn't even get a U-Haul or you couldn't, you know, buy or sell a home. I mean, people were still moving here in droves at probably the worst time to move. 1,039. And I say this all the time, but they don't bring asphalt with them. They don't bring fresh water with them. They don't bring drainage projects with them. Uh, they don't bring DPS officers. Those are the core functions of government that the state of Texas needs to provide for. And so as we as we look at that uh, and we look at next year's budget, um, you know, we have to get ahead of this. If Texas wants to continue to lead the nation in growth and this Texas miracle that's been going on for many, many years, then I think infrastructure is something that we have to get ahead of. Public education and health care take up 78% of our budget. Nearly 80% of the budget is written in one form or the other before we even walk in the building. So we have to account for the other 22%, whether it's infrastructure or public safety, uh, border security, you name it, that all has to come out of that 22%. And then we, and then we still have high taxes. Uh, the property taxes are through the roof. 
And I think that has to do with the appraisal system, and that's something else I think the House should take a long, hard look at. Um, so those are our challenges as we go into next session. Uh, they're good challenges to have because there's a lot of good growth. So let's talk about that growth. We, ad we added 77,800 jobs in February. We've made those type of job groups 21 out of the last 22 months. And that's, that's significant because you, know, you go back two years and you realize what, what we've been through the last two years. To have that type of growth, I mean, no other state is even close to that. Um, this is the fourth consecutive month of record-setting job growth. Each of the last four months, we've beaten the previous month. And that's in the history of the state of Texas. Uh, we're now at over 13 million jobs, which is an all-time high, beating the January of 2022 uh, high. The, uh, our employment grew by 6.7% this February compared to last February. And we were doing, we were doing okay last February. And that just goes to show we, we weren't in the middle of in the, in the, in the draws of, of COVID. Uh, that's the kind of growth we've seen. This is, where, this is, the, this is the really exciting stuff if, um, if you want to talk about appropriations and possibilities for infrastructure and tax reform. Uh, March sales tax was up 28.5% from last March. And that is, uh, even if you go back to pre-COVID, March of 2019 is still up 9%. That's the type of growth we're seeing here in Texas. The, uh, you know, all know about oil. It's, it's averaged about $91.64 uh, with just about 340 active rigs. And let me tell you that that represents, that rig count is nearly 50% of all the active rigs in the country or in the state of Texas. Half of all active rigs are in this state. And it's, uh, we, are driving, we are driving the entire nation right now when it comes to energy and energy independence. And we need to continue to do that. The um, sales tax is up 3.37 billion, uh, right at 3.37 billion. So if you go back uh, and look at, again, last March, that's 28.5% above last March. Now you imagine what kind of revenue projections are going to be coming. Motor fuels tax is up 19%, oil production tax is up 101%. Natural gas production is up 150%. Hotels up 55%. And that's important because I don't think many Texans understand how big of a deal the tourism in industry here is in Texas. The fact that the hotel taxes are up 55% means that people are going back out. They're, they're traveling, whether for business or for leisure. And that is great for cities and counties and for the state of Texas. And then alcohol beverage taxes, because of the margaritas that go, is up 27%. <laughs> and, I, you know, I, I, I tell the story all the time, too. I went, I went and picked up food for the family the other day, and I'm sitting there waiting for my order. And this guy walks in, he gets his food, and he walks out with four margaritas in, like, styrofoam cups. I'm like, you can't do that. That's illegal. I was like, oh, no, wait, we passed the bill. Like, I think I was there for that. <laughs> you can't. I was like, I'm calling the cops. This is ridiculous. <laughs> so... Uh, as of right now, and not to put my, not to try to outdo Glenn Hager, but as of right now, in, in talking to his office, uh, the estimated uh, general spending for the state of government going into the next session, as of now, is 135.32 billion. That is just the state side. That is up 15.1 percent from last session, which gives us a 11.99 billion dollar surplus as of right now. If we were starting session right now, it'd be $11.99 billion surplus, which means it's probably going to be more than that going into the next session because of what's going on, the, the, the economic activity here in the state of Texas. We also have $12.6 billion in the rainy day fund, which I would predict hits its statutory cap before we go into session, meaning you can't put any more money in it. And Hugh Sean tells me, uh, told me the other day, um, not to date you, Mr. Sean, but he was part of the original rainy day fund bill. And he's, what was the healthy balance y'all thought back in the day? Million. He thought $100 million would be a good healthy balance of the rainy day fund. It's at $12.6 billion. And what Mr. Hager will tell you is when he goes to Washington, D.C., I'm probably not Washington, D.C., when he goes to New York and he talks to the credit agencies. And I've heard this over and over again on appropriations. 
They will tell him, you know, it's great you have this rainy day fund. It's the most robust, healthy in the, in the, in the whole country. That's awesome. And it shows, you know, you've been, you, you've, you've uh, been conservative in your spending as you should be. But it, uh, $7 billion, $7.5 billion is probably a healthy balance in that fund. What you're lacking in the state of Texas is quality infrastructure. Your infrastructure is not keep, keeping up with your growth. Your infrastructure is old and it needs to be, you know, you need to think long and hard about your roads and your bridges and your waterways and everything else, your water supply, you name it. You're, you're growing that fast. We, you know, so they're telling us the piggy bank, it's great to have all this money, but you need to start spending, appropriate some of that money on capital expenditures that, that reflect your growth in the state of Texas. And that's coming from people much smarter than I in New York City telling our comptroller that. So with that, you've got, again, you've got this $11.99 billion surplus as of today. You got $12.6 billion of rainy day fund. You got $35 billion in infrastructure spending coming with the federal government. We have $3 billion in, in uh, ARPA funds, which was the, the, the COVID uh, appropriation from Congress uh, that we did not spend from last session, that many of us were talking about spending on, um, or on, uh, on property tax relief. It all adds up to a very uh, great opportunity here in the state of Texas to address Again, infrastructure spending and how we how we prepare for our growth and property tax relief, and I think that's something that I hope the House is laser focused on uh, next session. It's uh, the type of things that Chamber of Commerce crowds should appreciate because this is all about economic growth and, and growth for small, medium, and large businesses. And the state of Texas is here to to, to assist you in that. Um, I will say that going back to Disney, I know. Everyone in here wants to talk about Mickey Mouse and how offensive Mickey Mouse is. And I think we need to, I think we need to be talking about Goofy. <laughs> Goofy claims to be a dog. But Goofy has a dog named Pluto. I find that offensive. So if we're going to talk about Disney characters, then we're going to be offended by Disney, I think we need to be focused more on Goofy and less on Mickey Mouse. And again, my niece, who graduated from SFA, enjoys her job at Disney, and uh, I would hate to see her move back home and be unemployed. But um, <laughs> the House is going to focus on these issues. Uh, these are serious kitchen table issues, criminal justice reform, health care reform, um, infrastructure, the quality of life issues. Um, we're going to be laser focused on that. And I will say this morning I woke up and turned on the TV like many of y'all have done for the last month and you see what's happening overseas. You see what's happening in Europe. You see what's happening in the, and the atrocities. And we're able to live in a country where we can come to events like this and sit around tables like this and debate policy, real policy that affects our daily lives in a peaceful manner without having to worry about what, what's occurring in areas like the Ukraine. And I think it's just, you know, as I, and I do these events around the state, it's just a phenomenal, this country, I think we take it for granted how great this country is and the, 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 uh, the opportunity to have discourse and debate, uh, whether it's in, in rooms like this or panels like this afternoon, or whether it's on the House floor or the Senate floor, to be able to do it in a way that's respectful most of the time. And, uh, here in Texas, when we're done having those debates, we're still friends, like, like Representative Clardy said. Uh, we're not like Washington, D.C. And we, don't wanna, we do not want to be like Washington, D.C. Uh, we don't have aisles in the House. You don't have Republicans on one side or Democrats on the one side. You, you all sit together. Uh, we eat lunch together. We go to dinner together. And that's the way it should be. And then we, at, at the end of the day, we all go back home to our districts, and we live underneath those laws that we pass. It's a, it's a beautiful process. It's not always pretty. But at the end of the day, it's beautiful. So with that, I don't know if I can take questions or I can be done. You tell me on time. <laughs> Mr. Clardy has one more story he wants to tell. <laughs> but with that, uh, y'all, this is a beautiful day in Nacogdoches. Uh, be proud of this community. It is gorgeous. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be the speaker. I'm, I'm, and I'm honored to represent House District 21. I plan to do it as long as my wife lets me do it. Um, but it is, it's a phenomenal job, and I speak for all these House members and senators. Uh, we truly 
are here to serve you. And it, like Travis said, uh, this is your job. Um, you know, this is your office. We're just, we're just really lucky and fortunate to be able to, um, to hold that office for a while. God bless you all. God bless in Nacogdoches, and God bless the state of Texas. Thank you all. All right, thank you. Let's give the speaker of the Texas House another round of applause. Thank you for being here. So we're, we're going to try to stay on schedule very quickly. Uh, we, uh, we're going to do one thing, and, and gentlemen, I've heard what that list of stuff he talked about us uh, going to be working on. Uh, we've got our work cut out for us next session. Uh, what I appreciate is, you know, did you notice he never mentioned bathrooms and, and the priorities going into the next session? But pri bathrooms are priority now because we need to get out of this room. Uh, and we'll make our way down. There will be people guiding us out to take the auditoriums uh, to start our panels, which will start very quickly. Uh, Speaker Phelan may have an opportunity to visit with some, some folks afterwards. I know he needs to get back home. I do want to thank again SFA for having us out here and for making this uh, breakfast uh, and the whole event possible. Uh, I want to again thank our interpreters. You did a fantastic job. I want to see you thank yourself. That's good. <laughs> I want to thank the chamber, uh, Wayne Mitchell, uh, uh, Kelly Augustine, Barbara Hall, uh, Cameron Watson, our intern, thank you for the great job you've done putting this whole thing together. Uh, Donna Finley, Ted Smith, thank you again for the great job you've done. Let's go ahead and call it a day. Thank you for being here. Let's have a great panels and a great Lone Star Let's Day of Summit. Thank you.